Hello and welcome back to Uroru Niwa. My name is Mike Charlton. Well, it's been quite a while uh, for me. I'm hoping that it won't be quite a while for you. I had recorded the previous episode quite a long time ago and unfortunately I got very very busy at work and I just did not have the energy to edit all of the videos that I had going and so unfortunately it kind of piled up on me and I never got around to it. I'm going to try to make sure that doesn't happen again so I hope it will be a very short time between the last episode that you saw and this episode here but it's been a while since I've actually touched this code. Luckily I've been editing so I know what we were doing but we'll see how it goes. Today we're going to do some interesting things. Last time I promised you that we would get to do some test driven development and I also want to talk a little bit more I guess on a theoretical perspective about functional programming um, and we'll see how it goes. I don't know exactly how everything will pan out as usual but I hope you'll find it interesting nonetheless. All right, let's get started. So we have a few things to do before we get started. And one of the things we need to do is I have discovered the cause of some of the problems we've had with uh, my editor. So if I go back to here and if I move the cursor around, hopefully, yeah. So you see how it comes up with this LDOC error and it, it now gives me a, a much nicer error message actually. It says file error searching for a program, no such file or directory Elm Oracle. And what this means is that this is a plugin in my editor that I think it allows it to search for documentation. I don't actually know how to use it, but it's complaining that it doesn't have all the parts that it needs. So we need to just install that and hopefully it will be very quick. So uh, maybe we can just put this in our, um, if we want to work in a measured fashion, let's, uh, let's put it in our to-do here. And probably I should start a Pomodoro, shouldn't I? Let's start a reflection Pomodoro. Uh, why is B, D? B stands for break and D stands for demon. It just means it's running in the background. So we've got our one minute. Hopefully we can get things going. What I want to do is fix the LDOC error. The other thing that I wanted to do is we have uh, fix the LDOC error. And then there's also this thing called Elm format and it's just fmt i think is how it's done and maybe that's small e and what this does is that it automatically formats all of the indentation for you so that you don't have to remember all the stupid rules and this is i love this about elm um, it's something that i have used using um, the go language as well uh, google google go and they have this source code formatter and it encodes all of the kind of standard community ways of formatting and just does it automatically for you and your editor so you don't have to worry about it. For me that's just a lifesaver. So let's give it a go. So first we're going to get uh, with this Elm LDOC thing. Let's start our real Pomodoro. I kind of talked a bit too much again as usual. Now one of the reasons why I'm showing you this is not so much that you need to learn how to do this but to make sure that you understand again, that balance between being efficient and being productive. And so this is part of the efficiency side of things. And if you're going to be a good programmer, in my opinion, you really need to learn how to choose when you should be doing these kinds of things, and when you shouldn't be doing these kinds of things. So this is a good time to get this stuff done. And I think all I need to do actually is install Elm Oracle here. So I think I just need to go npm install. Let me just check on the internet. And is this an NPM? I'm guessing this is an NPM package. Yeah, so you can see it's an NPM package. So there we go. And it'll take a couple minutes. There we go. So that's good. It's complaining about my package.json, but I don't really care about that. Now to get this to actually work, what we need to do, I think before I do this, so I'm going to install the uh, formatter as well. Just search for Elm format. Right, so Elm format. Okay, I guess I was wrong. Or maybe it, maybe I have it installed already. So in Emacs, I probably already installed it and I don't need it to do anything, but I'm just going to quickly check. That's uh, part of Elm mode. Interesting, this Elm mode has uh, integration with Elm make as well and the REPL. I should learn how to use this and at some point I will show you how this all works. And this has got Elm Oracle as well. I don't know what all of these things are basically, but I've got Elm format 
and I'm guessing, so let's, if I just click on Elm Format, is it going to take me somewhere useful? Ah, this is where I am. Ah, I got a good piece of advice as well, which is to stop using NPM. And this is an excellent piece of advice. Do not use NPM. NPM really sucks. And I, I know this from experience. The dependency management on it is really lacking. But for what we're doing, it's okay for now. So, and I haven't gotten around to knowing what I'm supposed to do. So I don't know what APM is. I have absolutely no idea what it is, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to assume that I can do it with NPM. Given that I've done it before, if, I, if it's something that I didn't know what it was, then I couldn't have done it, obviously. So I've done it before, so it must be an NPM. Yes, and I will probably use Yarn or something like that. There's most of the Elm stuff is using this Elm package stuff, so you don't actually use NPM. It's just for kind of installing the setup stuff, which is why I'm not too worried about it, because anything that we're going to be installing, we're going to be installing using Elm's package manager itself. So it's not really a big deal. So now what I need to do is I need to quit my Emacs. Let's restart it. Now, now when I move the thing around, it doesn't complain anymore. Oh yes, it still complains. Why does it still go? Ah, I know why. Duh, because we need to run our little script here, our setup path. So let's do that. Uh, if I just say dot slash, I can get my tab completion. There we go. And remember this leading dot just means source. I can actually re retype this to be source like that, which might be clearer. And if you don't know what source does, you can just do this. Oh, this is actually for TCL. This is not the, not the right one. So in case you want to do it, then you have to actually man bash, which is like the longest man page in the history of Earth. One of the nice things of working on a Unix-like system is that virtually every command has what's called a man page, a manual page. And you just say man whatever, and you get the documentation. Um, this one is like super long. So, but if we look for a source, I'm hoping it won't be that hard. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this is talking about it, but not. Uh, let's see if we can find in the documentation. Yeah, I'm wasting time, and you should. There we go. So, source file name, read and execute the commands from file name in the current shell environment, and return the exit status of the last command executed from the file name. I won't go into it, but you can read it on your own if you want to know what it's actually doing. So now we've done that. So we've got to pass it up. So now um, if we run Emacs again, all right, let's move the cursor around. And now it doesn't complain anymore. Now the other thing that I've done, which I, I have done ahead of time, if I just go into my .emacs init.el and I search for Elm, L mode, you will see that I've actually set up this set queue Elm format on save. So this is just basically telling me every time I save, Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it's actually really cool. I just I just put the cursor on this variable, and it actually told me what it what it's for. That is actually super cool. So it controls whether or not Elm format should be run on the current buffer save. So I basically said, when I'm in Elm mode, I want to run Elm format when I save. So if I just kill this thing here, now if I save this file, let's say we just delete this line. And then I save this file. What it's going to do, it's going to reformat. See, now it formats and it's all nice and consistent and not wrong, which is excellent. And I didn't have to do anything. Like last time we spent a lot of time just kind of screwing around with that. And this will save us huge amounts of time. So that's why we do things like this. And I've wasted a whole Pomodoro, but it's not really wasted because it's something that you want to be doing anyway. Okay, episode Four, and we have done these things. That's done, and that's done. Very good. And this is in Pomodoro one. So now, I'm going to go into retrospective mode uh, because I'm going to just talk a little bit again about what we're going to do today. So we may not write that much code today. I'm hoping we'll we'll get into it pretty quickly. But I want to actually show you some other things at the moment. One is um, the test framework that we're going to be using. The other is I want to talk a little bit about types in a functional programming language and also what a function really is. 
If you've done any programming before, you probably have this idea in your head that I know what a function is. It's pretty, it's pretty obvious, right? Um, or if you've actually seen functions in math class, for instance, if you've taken some done these functions in math, you think to yourself, I know exactly what a function is. But functional programming has a very specific view of functions. And it's very important to understand that view in order to go forward um, and be a good functional programmer. And so I want to talk a little bit about this. And what I'm going to talk about is actually pretty much right out of a talk by a person named John DeGoes. But I'm going to I'm going to use some of his material, so I apologize in advance. If by some absolute miracle he actually sees this video, I apologize to you, John. I'm just completely stealing your material. But let's turn a new Pomodoro. What are we going to do first? All right, I think what we're going to do first is I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about functional programming a little bit. I'll put an exclamation mark because it's fun. And I'm going to run the REPL again. And you know what's funny? Every time I, I say the word REPL, I know what I mean, uh, but I keep forgetting what it actually stands for. What does, that, you know, what does REPL actually stand for? Ah, there we go. Read eval print loop. That makes complete sense. To me, anyway. <laughs> Especially in um, certain types of languages, like Lisp, for instance, uh, they have this idea of this read eval print loop. So what they do is the interpreter basically reads all of the text that you've given it, then it evaluates that text, and then it prints the output. And it goes back to the beginning and does the same thing again. And so it's read eval print. So if we go to here and we start the REPL again, I'm going to have to source my uh, thing again, pass, because we need to do it in this shell as well. I'm in the Elm REPL. And so what you can see is if I say one plus one, it's going to read that, it's going to evaluate it, and it's going to print the result. So it read this string, one plus one, then it evaluated it to generate the number two, and then it printed that number out. And that's what a REPL is. That's what we're doing. Now, one of the things that I want to do, and I'm not sure I can do this from the REPL. I actually have never tried an Elm, and it really depends on exactly how they've set up this REPL, but we might give it a try anyway. I want to talk a little bit about functions. Now, we've seen some functions, right? So for instance, if I say f, and let's say it takes a, it takes a parameter x, and we just say it's equal to x plus 1, See, I wonder if the, I can actually use this now. So I say f of 2, we get 3. So yeah, I can use it. That's very nice. And so what this means is I've got this function called f. It takes a parameter called x, and then it evaluates it to be x plus 1. And you'll notice that it output this type. This is actually the type of the function. So this is, this is a function, and it takes a number as input, right? And it outputs a number here, the output. So it just takes a number and outputs a number. If you're writing in JavaScript, or you're writing in Java, or you're writing in C, that's kind of the way you think about it. But if you're thinking in a functional way of, of doing things, there's actually a different way to look at this. I've got a domain. Okay, a domain is kind of a set of values. And I have what you call a codomain, which is also another set of values. And I want to map which basically just means connect my domain to my codomain. I just wanted to connect one set of values to another set of values. I forgot how you do this in Elm, so I just want to look this up. I need to make what they call a union type in Elm. I just forget the syntax, so I just want to have a quick look. Yeah, here we go. It's just like that, good. So if I just say type, and then the name of my type, and I'm just going to call it beverages, is equal to, and let's say we've got cola, Oh, let's, let's actually start with beer. I like beer. And then there's cola, which I'm kind of indifferent about. And then we're going to say like corn soup, which I absolutely hate. I absolutely, absolutely hate corn soup. Now, you might be saying this is not really a beverage. And it's really true. But it's a, it's kind of an in-joke, which I won't explain. So, so we have these three, kind of three values, which is beer, cola, and corn soup. Ah, he does not like it. Am I missing something in the syntax? Ah, yes, I am. I need to put bars between them, of course. That makes sense. Because otherwise, it doesn't know whether that's a parameterized type or whether that's three different kinds of types. There we go. That's much better. I have my three beverages. Now, this is going over time, and I apologize. This will go over time because it, it takes a little while to explain. But let's say we have now I have a reaction, 
And I can either be happy, I can be indifferent, it needs to be a capital letter, or I can be unhappy. What I want to do is I want to actually map, or I want to connect these things from the beverages, right? Oh, I'll just highlight this. I want to connect from the beverages to the reaction. So if I drink one of these things, I get happy. If I drink another one, I'm indifferent. And if I drink the last one, I'm unhappy. Now, as you, as you saw, corn soup makes me very unhappy, makes me very, very unhappy because it is disgusting. Uh, it's the worst thing I can possibly imagine. Cola makes me completely indifferent, really. I, I mean, I enjoy it, like, as, as, you know, it's fine, but I don't go out of my way to get cola. Um, a beer, I go out of my way to get beer, especially good beer. I really, really like good beer, so it makes me very, very happy. We need a way to map between those, and we do that using what's called a function. And we can say, let's just say drink. We have to drink something, right? So we, we drink something, and I'm going to call it beverage, but we use a small b for beverage, not the capital B, because this is a variable, not a type. But an equal sign. I'm going to now, what I need to do here, and I wonder whether the REPL can actually handle this, because um, I don't know how, if it's very good at multiple line things. Now, I forget how to do a case statement. I hope it tells me here, actually. Uh, there we go. So I'm just going to, if I just say equal here, does it let me continue? No, it doesn't. Um, REPL. Ah, apparently there's a bug outstanding. Ah, I can just say backslash. Sounds good. All right. I'm happy with that. So I just put backslash, so let me continue. Case beverage. Uh, I believe that's what it says. Yeah. So for each kind of beverage that we might get, oh, I forgot the backsplash. The backsplash. If we get beer, right, then we're happy. And I believe that's the right syntax. We'll just quickly check. Looks good to me. And if we get cola, we're indifferent. If we get corn soup, we are unhappy. Look at that. And you can see here, oh, it's interesting that it put it in the namespace for me, this REPL namespace. I wondered how I was going to do that. Maybe that'll be a conversation for another time. But basically, it's made this function. And what it said is that I am mapping these beverages to these reactions. And that's what this arrow really means. It means I'm mapping from here to here. And this is what is called a domain. The beverages is the domain. And the reaction is called the codomain. You always map from the domain to the codomain. Let's give it a try. And so if I drink beer, I'm happy. Yay. It, I'll put happy. And then it told me what its type was. It says this is a reaction type. Yeah. And if I drink cola, I'm indifferent. And if I drink corn soup, I'm unhappy. Now, one of the cool things about functional programming is, all right, there, there's actually rules about this. And one of the nice things about the, these rules is that it makes it much easier to reason about your programs. There's really just two rules about these functions. One is that I need to be able to map from everything in my domain to something in the codomain. I don't have to map to everything in the codomain, but I have, everything that's in the domain, there has to be a map to it. So let's redefine beverage. I'm not sure if it'll let me redefine beverage, but so let's actually make a different, we'll call it drink two. So drink two is a beverage. Also, we gotta do the case beverage of, and then for beer, makes me happy. For corn soup, makes me unhappy. Aha, it gave us an error. And that's because we didn't say anything about cola. And you need to add something in there about cola because that's in our domain. Now let's say, for instance, let's try again with our drink two. Let's say beer makes me happy. Let's say that cola also makes me happy. And I'm sorry, corn soup is never going to make me happy. So that's gonna be unhappy. 
and you can see the drink two is now fine even though we didn't use indifferent so you always have to use all of the things in your domain but you don't have to use all of the things in your codomain that's one of the rules of this thing the other rule of functional programming is that no matter how many times I run the function, the drink function, no matter how many times I drink corn soup, I'm going to be unhappy. And I could do it a hundred times. I'm always going to be unhappy. It's never going to change. It has a very strange name. It's called idempotent, idempotent. And it just means that if you have the same input, you always get the same output, no matter what. And now the same thing, if we go back and we look at our original f function, f of x equals x plus 1, right? This is our function. This x, whatever type this x is, now this happens to be, it actually infers that this must be a number. The reason it infers that that must be a number is because I'm using this plus operator here. And plus operator only works on numbers. And so it said, well, this has to be a number, and therefore this has to be a number. There's only one way of doing it. So we make that function f of x. So if I just actually type f, it says, oh, it's a function, and it maps from numbers to numbers. I and mean, it does actually do that, right? So I say f of 2, it returns 3. Now if I do it a million times, f of 2 is always going to return 3. It doesn't matter. And this just maps from the domain of numbers to the codomain of numbers. It's the same, same thing, right? It's going from one thing to the next. And that's totally fine. Uh, I could also make a function, for instance. Let's try this. What do I want to drink next? So let's say I'll make a function drink next x. And this tells me when I drink something, I, I want it to tell me what I should drink next. Case x of I drink beer. Probably I should have a cola next because if I drink beer, if I continue to drink beer, I'm going to get too drunk. So it's probably a good idea to space it out with a cola. And cola doesn't make me too unhappy. If I drink cola, after I drink cola, I probably want to drink beer because I've had that spacer. Now I can drink another beer. And if I drink corn soup, I'd better not drink the beer because I'll probably throw up. I think I'd better drink cola again. I'm never going to drink corn soup on purpose, basically. And so now we have a function that maps from beverages to beverages. So we can map from the same uh, domain to the same codomain, just like that. That's perfectly fine. And again, this function, if I say drink next beer, uh, I've spelled it wrong, drink next beer, it gives me cola, drink next cola, gives me beer, and drink next corn soup, gives me cola. So that's, that's what functions are. In the one case, if I just type beverages, I probably need to type repl.beverages. Uh, no, I guess I just need to type beverages. It doesn't let me do that. That's kind of unfortunate. It would be nice if the REPL would be able to evaluate types, but that's fine. One of the things to, again, understand is that I have this function, and numbers are not like beverages. Beverages, I had a limited set of things that a beverage could be, and numbers, of course, I have a completely unlimited set. And I wonder, for instance, if we've made a function, and I'm wasting time, but I think this is interesting to try. But what if we make a function g that takes a number and returns a reaction? So I wonder if we can do that. If y, and I assume it's equal equals. How do you do if statements in Elm? I don't know, actually. Let's just check. Google's amazing, by the way. <laughs> I mean, you may realize that I Google it almost everything but it really does find things extremely well all right where's the, where's my if statement if there we go there we go that's how you do it looks good so if i say if oh i see yeah because i need an else clause you in in elm you always have an else clause that's how this how it deals with it so if let's say if y equals one then we want to return beer, else, cola. Yeah, there we go. If I say g of 1, I get beer. If I have g of 10,000, I get cola. Or g of minus 5, I get, said b, g of minus 5, 
I get cola. The important thing again to realize here is that it, let me just scroll up a little bit. The important thing to realize here is that this else clause deals with that problem where I said in the domain, you have to deal with every single number in the domain. If I have one, then I get beer, but then I have to deal with every other number that's not one. And that's what that else clause gives me. So we've, we've uh, talked a lot about this and I think we're going to virtually run out of time. I'm not sure how much time we've actually taken, but I think it's a useful conversation. So let's go back to our thing. So we've talked about functions and I hope you found that interesting. Now, the next thing that we had on our list, Pomodoro 3, is, actually, maybe I'll just go into my, the next thing we had on our list, I am terrible at spelling. Let's get some tests going. What I'm going to do is there is a test framework and it's called Elm Test. Elm Test is actually very, very nice. I've been really impressed with it. And in fact, I've been impressed in general with Elm. I've been using PureScript in my own kind of playing around, but lately I've tried to use some Elm and I really like it. I really like the compiler. I like the output it gives me. It's really nice and simple and, and works really, really well. So I, I've, I've really been enjoying it. And this test suite as well is actually very, very nice. And we're going to quickly try to do a test. Oh, here we go. Let me just start a Pomodoro. Okay, we're going to install this Elm test. Again, what we're going to do is we're going to install Elm test with NPM. And I apologize for not using Yarn. So NPM install Elm test. Yeah, I got confused because this heading just said running tests locally when it also tells you how to install it. So what we need to do then is we're going to do this Elm test init, and this creates tests inside my directory. Elm test init. So that sets up some things. You'll notice that it created a directory called tests, creates a new Elm package.json file in that test because it treats the test kind of like a separate Elm project. It creates a main.elm file, it creates a test.elm file, and adds a .git ignore file. Now this .git ignore, we're going to talk at another time about git. So copy all the dependencies from Elm package JSON into test Elm package JSON. Well, at the moment, I think we do not have any dependencies, so that's good. And then we just run Elm test. It's installing all of the things that it needs to install all the packages. So this is what Elm package is useful for. It's got, so it's actually installing all of these Elm package things. And then it runs and it's very nice. This is one of the things I really, really like about kind of the Elm community. You have people who really know what they're doing. And I love this, that you run the Elm test. So you do your Elm init and you run the Elm test. And the first thing it does is it gives you a failing test that you should remove. And that's really fantastic because this is how you do testing. This is part of TDD, is you start with a failing test. And why do you start with a failing test? And the reason is so that you know that your test system is working. That's really all you want. You want to start and say like, okay, I'll write a test that I expect to fail, and then I'll run the test and show that it failed. And that tells me that my test system is actually working. And so what we can do is we can remove that test, figure out how to do it. Um, so go into source, no, sorry, go into tests now. I'm guessing that's in test.elm. You can see that it's got a sample test suite which shows you how to write tests. And then there should be a failing test. There we go, this test should fail, you should remove it. So we will just delete that. There we go, now we've installed Elm test and that's all good. So I'm gonna go back to our to-do. And that's what I'm going to just do. I'm going to change this to install um, test. I've got one more minute. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to our uh, main directory. Now, we were talking a lot about functions. And so you should recognize now that we have two functions here. We have the uh, main function. It's called main. 
and you can see that it doesn't take any input at all. Before we had that f and we, we passed it in x, so it's, not, it's mapping from no domain to some codomain. Uh, and this is what this Elm Oracle does apparently. Oh, uh, this is really amazing. Look at that. It tells me what it's outputting, right? So this div takes a list of HTML attribute message, a list of HTML message, and outputs an HTML message. That's really amazing. So if I put over main, does it tell me? No, because it's just looking at the documentation. Oh, that's pretty cool though. Same thing here on h1. Does it know about h1? You did eventually get it. It's just slow. So again, this takes a list of attributes, a list of HTML, and outputs an HTML message. That's really cool. What we can do here is uh, we can annotate our own functions as well. So if we look here on main, we can do exactly the same thing that it was doing. And we can say main, and it doesn't take anything at all, uh, but it returns a HTML message, right? Because this function here, final thing here, is outputting an HTML message. So let's just do that. And I think that's actually correct. Uh, it's not happy with something. You can see with these new with these new plugins I've got that it's much uh, more responsive now. It tells me things that I'm doing wrong. It's probably not happy that I don't have anything as input here. So I'm not quite sure what I should do in the case. Oh, I see. We just do that. I don't need the arrow. There, that makes sense. Now it's not complaining anymore. Now if I compile it, and I did actually discover what was going on with this Elm make, is that it doesn't work the way I expected it to. You actually do always have to tell it what you're building, which kind of sucks, but... And this um, su successfully compiled will compile this, but for instance, if you can see all this Elm stuff here, if I actually delete that, now if I recompile this, it's going to ask me to download all of that stuff again. And then you'll see that it compiled 38 modules. Whatever we have as dependencies, it will actually download them and compile them. Uh, and that's how that works. So you basically just give it the top level file that you want to compile, and then it figures out the rest. I was hoping that it could actually tell whether or not it, it needed to do anything um, and know what it was that it was supposed to compile, but it can't figure that out by itself, which is unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. But there you can see it worked. And if we actually go back to our main program here, we can see that we haven't done anything bad. Now again, we can document again, this one points. You can see again, we're just running this one function. So it's going to the output, right? The codomain is going to be this HTML message at the, at the other end, right? And we don't take any parameters in. So we can do the same thing here. And this is just annotating what we're doing. And what's nice again about this plugin that I have is that it, I don't actually even need to compile it because when it saves it, it actually checks the, the syntax for me and complains if it's wrong. So there we've got that. Now it would be nice to uh, be able to write some tests, but I think it's going to take us longer than we have to do that. So it's been a kind of unstructured day today and uh, I apologize for that, but I think we've done some interesting things. And next time, what I'm going to do actually, let's just go back to the to-do list. I'm going to take this these points and we're going to need to kind of extract this number because we're going to need to decrement that at some point and that's when we're going to get into writing some tests. So we've installed the test framework and we've talked about this and next time we're going to actually do something about that. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I think we probably went a little bit long today uh, but I hope you found it worthwhile. This has been Uroro Niwa. My name is Mike Charlton. I'll see you next time.